Thank you, and a sincere thank you for, for inviting me. Um, my background, as Bernie said, is mainly kind of mortgage markets and housing, really quite a narrow kind of field. And in recent years, I've been broadening to, to uh, urban economics, proper urban economics, and also issues of urban segregation and inequality. There's the sociology, uh, spatial economy interface is, is really what's exciting me. And I don't claim to be an expert in these fields as yet, um, but we have, a, I think, an exciting research program, which um, I guess I'm going to talk about all be in a, in, a, in a slightly different way to, to how we told the funders so uh, we're going to do the work. So this, is, this work really re relates to a project that we have funded for the next five years that with quite a large team of people, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. later. Um, but the key, the key thing is that I think it raises some really interesting questions. From myself coming from a kind of an economics, housing background, looking at these Issues. I think there's some really interesting methodological and even theological, and uh, I won't say too much about that, but uh, uh, certainly econometric issues, and, and hopefully you'll get, you'll get some good points. When I've used this title before, residential segregation, it has provoked uh, mixed reactions because it means the word, the word segregation is a lonely term, it means different things to different people. I guess for many people it, it has it conjures images of apartheid in South Africa or in America where people were by law restricted from living in certain places or accessing certain communities. I think what's really interesting is that when those laws are being repealed, so in most Western countries I guess we don't have legally imposed segregation, what we find is that cities haven't become this wonderful kind of perfectly even mix of race and religion. And in fact, what we see is a very powerful process at work, whatever that process is, that causes self-segregation. So I, I use that word unapologetically, but I don't use it necessarily in a pejorative way. In fact, some argue that segregation is a good thing. I don't know if you've come across Paul Chester's work, who talks about not about segregation, but about specialised neighbourhoods where the concentration of people by a particular race or religion in, in, in particular areas is actually a good thing because that increases the variety and choice in a, a society. So for example, if I was wanting to move to Cambridge, I might be looking for a, a neighbourhood that was made up of Welsh economists because I know that I would feel comfortable there, I'd be able to talk their language, etc. Um, if no such neighbourhood existed, in other words, if Cambridge and other cities were uh, had neighbourhoods that were a perfectly even mix of the entire uh, makeup of that, that city, there would be no choice. Every neighbourhood would be the same. So one argument is that actually segregation is a positive thing, it's a good thing. For others, of course, uh, segregation is, is, a very, is a deeply worrying thing. And perhaps a, a good example of this, uh, of a person who's raised these concerns is, is <coughs> Trevor Phillips, former uh, head of the Commission for, for Racial and Equality. And he, he famously talked about the UK sleepwalking into, into segregation. The UK becoming more and more segregated, um, uh, spatially segregated by race and religion and ethnic groups, and how that was uh, 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 something that was deeply concerning. It's a sign of, of social fragmentation. And I think that uh, this, this fragmentation isn't just about the choices of individuals, people's individual preferences about where they uh, want to live. There is some of I view an institutional component to this. The state has a role in its policies in perhaps inadvertently uh, causing this segregation to be exacerbated. Boris Johnson, a um, year or so back, uh, entered this debate by saying that reforms to housing benefit in London would cause ethnic cleansing, would drive out people um, of particular racial and ethnic groups because they simply won't be able to afford to, to stay living in, in the centre of, of London. And that would have a detrimental effect, he was arguing, on this kind of rich variety, this rich makeup. And <clears throat> I think there are some interesting uh, aspects of this that go beyond uh, race and religion. Danny Dolly, for example, <coughs> has taught and, uh, at length, I guess, about apparent segregation by wealth and, and, and income. Concentration 
Um, the extreme example of this would be um, gated communities. This is the kind of the, the, the nightmare scenario for, for those on the left. They, they certainly wouldn't call it specialised neighbourhoods. Clearly, a, a, a really topical issue, one of great concern in, in society, partly uh, entering the news recently because of the results coming through from the, from the latest census in England and Wales and also in Northern Ireland. And what's interesting from the Northern Ireland results is how the sooner you think you understand what segregation is, something will happen that will just make you realise it's something, it's something deeper and more unpredictable than what you might expect. The latest results for Northern Ireland, for Belfast, for example, actually show a decline in segregation between Catholics and Protestants. But that decline is not due to the peace process. It's due to in-migration from Catholic Polish uh, households. And those Catholic uh, Polish households are located in Protestant areas. And they seem to be very happy. <laughs> So just when you think that this is a segregation that's about religion, actually it's not about religion, it's about something else, it's about something to do with historical conflicts, identities, territories, etc. I think the, for me, the, the coming new to this picture, the, there are some core issues, I think, about how we define and measure segregation and how we understand its causes and its consequences, which I think are, are profound, deeply interesting with uh, real policy connections. So in this lecture I'm going to um, talk to this, uh, this topic, really looking at, I guess the angle I'm going to take, or part of the angle I'm going to take is, is to say, what can we as urban economists learn from the literature on, on social uh, segregation and what can the literature on social segregation learn from the kind of spatial uh, econometrics and urban economics literature? And I'm going to structure this talk around these, these six kind of rhetorical statements. First of all, space is important, space is random, space is asymmetric, space has wormholes, space is dynamic, and space is endogenous. And just to emphasize that these ideas and plans are not just my own, really very much a team effort, and I'm just here to represent the team, and I should say a little bit about it. The project I'm referring to is called the Acumen Project, um, uh, Applied Quantum Investments Network, and has three research, research projects for the next five years, and this is the one I'm talking about. This is the one I lead here, Urban Segregation Report Team, a team of people. So, looking first at this uh, statement, space is important, I guess it, it's, almost, it's uh, almost a banal statement and uh, an obvious one if, you, if, you, if, you're a, if you're a spatial regional economist. Um, but what's really, what really surprised me when I started looking at the literature on measurement of segregation was that the most popular measure, the similarity index, which is a bit like a bit like the Gini coefficient. In fact, it is to, to segregation uh, research what the Gini coefficient is to inequality research. This, by far the most popular measure, as far from what I can tell, is completely non spatial. And essentially, what it does is it measures the proportion of members of a particular group that would have to change the area of residence, category really, because have to be spatial, to obtain an even distribution. We believe, and I'm going to show you in a moment some evidence, that that definition, this measurement that's become so popular, is highly sensitive to how you draw <coughs> boundaries of these area units. It completely ignores the spatial pattern within area units, and it completely ignores the spatial pattern of contiguous uh, area units. So why is this um, a problem? Why, why is my gut instinct that a, a measure of segregation that doesn't have a space that makes it to it is problematic. Well, first of all, the, the drivers, if the drivers of segregation, the processes that lead to it, are fundamentally spatial, of, fundamental spatial components to it, then you'd, you'd really want a measure that, that allows you to pick up that spatial process, or allow you to distinguish between 
competing spatial um, uh, theoretical drivers. And of course also the consequences of segregation are again profoundly spatial. The whole neighbourhood effects literature is premised on this idea that if you, if you have a spatial concentration of poor people as opposed to a random even scattering of poor people across space, that spatial clustering leads to non-linear effects through, to, uh, through role model effects, through uh, <coughs> stigmatisation, through exclusion from uh, social networks, a variety of, of very powerful theoretical reasons why neighbourhood effects would mean that spatial contradiction of poor people uh, is a bad idea. So there are, there are consequences of the spatiality of segregation. And if that's true, then that has policy implications and it means that our measures really need to be able to uh, understand the nuances of that spatiality. What theories uh, are there then of segregation? Um, I won't talk at length about this, but I'll, I'll introduce the, the most famous one, which is the, the Schelling model. And if you're not familiar with the Schelling model, the Schelling model basically says that even if uh, households do not want to live in a segregated society, let's suppose we all want to live in a mixed uh, neighbourhood. However, let's suppose that we don't want to be in a minority. So if I do move to Cambridge, I'm happy to be su surrounded by Scottish people or English people, so, so long as I'm not in the minority, as long as the majority of people living near me are, are Welsh economists and they will be And if I'm in the majority, if I'm, if I'm where I'm living is surrounded by people, the majority of whom are like me, I'm, I'm happy to stay there, I won't move. However, if I'm surrounded by uh, the majority of people that are different to me, then I will want to relocate. And that simple idea, um, showing has shown, the, shown theoretically in his original model, would lead to, to high levels of segregation. So this is a very simple version of it where you have uh, a grid square of, of houses. So this house here in the middle is surrounded by eight houses around the outside. If more than four of those houses around the outside are, are occupied by people of a different race or religion, they will want to move. And what Shanning did was he said, well, if you start off with a random allocation of um, the blue and green households and you allow that, that move to take place, and over successive rounds of moves, what you end up with is a society that has a very high level, high degree of segregation. Of course, the disability me measure is not the only measure out there. There's a huge literature on, on segregation uh, measures. Massive Denton's paper looks at four or five categories, evenness, exposure, concentration, centralization, uh, clustering. And so you might say, well, why are you contemplating contributing to these hundreds of measures that are already out there? Well, one, uh, one troubling thing for me looking at this literature is how do we know that each of these measures that have been allocated to these different dimensions of segregation, how do we know they're actually measuring what we think they're measuring? As I can tell, there's no systematic comparison based on simulated data, for example, to actually see whether they're telling us what we think uh, they're telling us. Another challenge, I think, is another complicated factor in this literature <coughs> is that um, segregation measurement has to take into account of a random spatial uh, clustering. When we uh, first bought our when we bought our first house in Glasgow, one of the challenges was that the little boy next door would throw stones and half bricks over the fence uh, into our garden, and uh, it was a very high fence and it was a very little boy. So his throwing of stones was completely random. Uh, didn't know what he was aiming for. Uh, so that was, that was a little bit troubling for us since we had a young child at the time. But what was interesting was that the spatial pattern I noticed of, the, uh, of where those stones landed in our garden was not even. There was a, a natural random clustering, like craters on the moon, uh, 
are not evenly spaced. It, it, it's a purely random process, but nevertheless there's clustering. And that raises a challenge uh, for um, those interested in measuring and understanding se segregation, because if you get a pattern like this, which is um, the, the white gaps in the middle where white households live, and let's say the, the black dots were black households, and that, if you looked at that pattern, you'd, you'd think that there was a degree of segregation there, a degree of plus three. But how do you know that that pattern is not simply the result of a process that's just by chance, no systematic or deterministic process? And in fact, that's exactly what that is. I just derived that pattern as a, just a part of this bigger uh, draw from a uniform probability distribution. Round zero in a, in a shell model. We are still, uh, as a team, reading the literature and understanding it, but we've yet to find any paper on measuring res residential segregation that takes into account this problem. There's no inference in the segregation measure. I, I'm, if that's true, that's, that's pretty astounding. Of course, to uh, urban economists uh, like yourself, this is not a new problem. Uh, here's one paper I'm familiar with, um, which is the Ranford Logan's paper looking at what they call localization, basal clustering of, uh, of industries of particular types, and how, how do you tell um, in terms of distance from randomness whether that's a significant test. <clears throat> so part of what we want to address is, is, is to come up with an inference. That's part of our, our kind of remit as a team. We have some, some statisticians working with us that, that will hopefully help us develop that. And we also, what we also want to do is, a, is to find a systematic way of seeing whether how well these different measures summarized by Massey and Denton and others, how well they, they disentangle different theoretical drivers of processes of segregation. For example, if you wanted to distinguish between different rounds of a segregation process, and we've done some initial uh, work on this, say comparing uh, a round zero that's purely a random pattern and then allowing <coughs> people to move in round one. We can see visually that's very different to that. Um, but how well do these different measures do in, this, in distinguishing between the two? And also, how sensitive are these different measures to, to the modifiable area unit problem? If you just allow the boundaries to shift a little bit, how much um, does that affect the outcome of the results? Given the underlying spatial patterns remain exactly the same, you're wanting a measure that's going to be fairly robust. Otherwise, when you compare in different cities and different uh, modifiable, uh, uh, different area units, you're going to get, get very different results for a different reason. Well, our initial work uh, by running thousands of these shelling uh, type processes um, to get a sampling distribution um, for each of these, uh, I normally just looked at the similarity measure, we find that sure enough there is a uh, sampling distribution, there's in some cases quite a broad one, but also quite startling is how much the sampling distribution shifts around when you tweak the area of units. So we're interested in detecting theoretical process sensitivity to the modifiable area unit problem, sensitivity to random clustering, the issue of inference. And finally, we're also interested in the impacts of irregular spatial patterning of residential locations. Because of course in the real world, the shelling grid uh, simulation doesn't exist, and uh, I'd be interested to know if, if you if you know of a, a shelling process that's been applied to to variable density uh, residential data or real address data. And that, well, that's certainly what we plan to do. We just if anything else has done that. So, how does this affect the shelling process when you have variable uh, spatial patterns? and variable street shape. For example, if, if a street shape looks like that, does that give you a different shelling outcome uh, to, 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 to a pattern that looks like that? And also, how does that affect these measures of segregation? How well do they cope with cities having different uh, patterns of, of residential locations? So if you imagine you've got um, Welsh and Scottish people, you say, OK, we'll randomly scatter them on those dots and then run a shelling process. How does that? Uh, that's the 
So I think, hopefully you can see why uh, I'm feeling there's lots to explore and lots that, that, um, that the residential segregation should potentially gain from working with, with spatial nutrition. But also I think uh, perhaps there's a uh, question of whether we could also, whether there's some interesting insights from these literatures and these issues that might be of relevance to the kind of models we build in, in, in economics. And this is